So let's take a look at some of the things that we're going to need for this lesson. And this is going to be a two day or a three day, possibly a four day lesson, depending on how serious you take this project. The, um, the ingredients or the supplies you're going to need are located here. We're going to need paper, which is going to be uh, the first section. We're going to be um, making colored paper. You will need something that's a little bit stiffer. I like cardstock or some kind of like um, thicker paper for the final project. So um, this one is going to be about 9 by 12 or 8.5 by 11, so that size paper. That's going to be for the final project, so I'm keeping that aside for now. I like to have a plate where we can put our paints onto, a cup of water so that you can clean your brush, Two different size brushes, a large brush and a small brush, and make sure you have one with a nice fun um, point on the end. We're going to learn about that soon. You'll need some glues for the project, um, a pair of scissors, not two, and um, let's get started. So the first thing I want to teach you is step number one, which is going to be making paper. And this is so much fun for the kids because you can really pitch it to them as like, you are about to make paper. Instead of going to the store and buying colored paper, we're gonna make the textured paper. So you watched the video with Eric Carl on how he makes his paper. And he makes his paper using tissue paper. Now, give me just a second. I do have some tissue paper. The tissue paper that Eric Carl uses is a white tissue paper, um, and it has this kind of texture right here. The problem with using tissue paper for this project is for the younger grade levels, it's very challenging for them. Um, I have done it before. You have to use acrylic, which is more expensive and it's more permanent. So I prefer not to use tissue paper for this project, but I did want to show you that if you felt like trying it on your own, just to see what it's like, grab some of the tissue paper you bought for this class and experiment with painting on top of it for that reason. So we're going to go the safer route for pre-K through third grade is to just use regular construction paper or a heavy duty like drawing paper because we're going to be adding paper, um, some colors to this. I like to set this class up for this lesson. I like to set it up as a production line and it's so much fun. You can set up in your classroom like six different tables with six different colors. And then what you can do is you can have each um, group of kids go to each table, ring a bell, and then they go to a next table. And then the whole idea is they are making paper for everyone in the class, not just for themselves. So this teaches them a lot about how to work together as a team to um, create a production line to have paper ready for this project. So the first thing you wanna do is I'm gonna take two pieces of paper and I am gonna divide them in half. It does not matter how accurate you are here because we are just going to be cutting this up later uh, for collage purposes. So what I've done is I've made smaller pieces of paper. Uh, if you're in the classroom, I would suggest using uh, larger papers and just having a huge production line and creating a bunch of papers because the cool thing is afterwards they get to sort the paper by color and the kids have a lot of fun doing that too. So um, here's my different papers. Since we're only making one artwork, we're not making it for the whole class, I made them smaller. Okay, so you have all of these. Now let's get the tools out that I want to do. First of all, I'm going to start with orange. I like to stick with the primary colors, secondary colors, and white and black. You will find that a lot of blue, white, and black will be utilized for this project, so make sure you kind of are heavy on those colors. Um, and also yellow, because a lot of kids like to put their sun in the picture. So what you're going to do is you're going to start out by making a glob of um, orange paint or whatever color it is. I like to get my brush wet first and then I dip it in and I'm going to cover 
the entire piece of paper. Now, actually, to be honest, I used way too much orange. You don't want to use that much orange. But this goes on nice and smooth. The kids love doing this. Covering up every single square inch of this paper is so much fun for them. Now this is predominantly an orange paper. But like Eric Carl, he likes to jazz things up and change it so that there's more textures in there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to clean my brush and wipe it on the paper towel to clean it out. And I wanna add some texture to this. So I'm gonna think about colors that would really work. A lot of like grays and whites, neutral colors are really helpful for adding textures. So watch what I can do now. I can take my smaller brush and I'm gonna to start to add some pattern to this. Right on top, just like in that video, you saw Eric Carl doing all these different patterns. You are creating all different types of patterns. This is a predominantly orange piece of paper, but now you get to mess with it some. Now I'm gonna clean my brush out and I'm gonna turn my brush the opposite direction and I'm gonna to start to add some squiggle text. I mean, some squiggle lines here to add some extra texture. So I still have those kind of polka dotted look but I've added some texture. I could add one more color, this is up to you. I want you to experiment with this. I could add perhaps maybe a little bit of red because this is kind of warm tones right now. I could come in and add some extra tones here. And I think you're gonna have so much fun doing this part of the project. Okay, I like the way that looks. I am done with my predominantly orange paper. It looks fantastic. It's got some textures. It's got um, different patterns, a repetition, and it's a much more interesting uh, collage paper to work with rather than just working with an orange piece of paper. So what I want you to do is to set that aside and then I want you to make predominantly blue, predominantly yellow, predominantly black, white, uh, red, green, all the colors uh, that you have. Now, uh, if you don't have a particular secondary color, make sure you um, leave enough space to go ahead and mix that up. I'm gonna finish the rest of my papers off camera, and then we'll be back for after these are dry and what we're gonna do next. And I wanted to share with you a little bit of technique on how to splatter paint because kids are gonna learn this, but they will go nuts with it. So I need to teach you some techniques to how to control the students so they don't go crazy with splatter paint, and they will, okay? So I've already um, added white paint to this, and I started doing some splatters, but you can see it's textured. It already has some white paint on there. So what you do, how you teach splattering safely is always wearing a smock, okay? You get uh, your brush nice and wet, and then you add some water, just to your palette. See that here, added some water. Mine's a little dirty, that's okay because I've been adding black to it. And then you just add some black to it. And then if it's not wet enough, you just add a little more water. Okay, now the trick is to always shoot downward, not both up and down. You really have to make this clear to the students. So you only go down, 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 like that. You do not go both up and down when you splatter only the downward motion. The table is gonna get filthy, but I'll tell you what, the kids love cleaning up the table. I like to use um, what is that, shaving cream to help clean the table or any kind of rags or anything like that. They love cleaning up afterwards, so you're not gonna have a problem with that. So I created that texture right there. So now I've got kind of a black and white piece of paper.
Now when you're mixing your yellow and blue together to create green, there's something really important I need you to know. It's same with red and, and um, yellow for making your orange. Use more yellow and just add a tiny bit of blue at a time because it really does overpower the image. And sometimes I even like mixing it on the paper because it creates a whole new variety of greens. So notice I'll put some white on, I mean some yellow on there. And then I'll come in with a little bit of blue on top of it. And it creates a variety of greens on my paper. So um, some artists like to do that and they mix straight on the paper instead of on their palette. That's a different way of doing it. Or you can do it like this, how I created it together right there. The cool thing is I have a variety of greens now on this page. And if it looks too blue in some areas, I just add a little more yellow on top of it. It's kind of a wet on wet process that I'm using. Wet paint on top of wet paint and it kind of mixes. I like the way that's looking. I'm going to add a little bit more blue over here because it's looking a little bit too yellow. Cool. Liking the way that looks. Now I'm going to add some texture. I really like adding a little bit of the white texture. And again, I like to scratch, blends that together a little bit. Liking the way that looks. There's my green. Now when I do my blue, I like to think blue is typically used for skies or water in pictures. So kids use that a lot. And this darker blue doesn't really do well for for that kind of work in a, in a child's picture. So I like to add white to my blue to give it more of a sky blue effect. So what I do is I add white on wet blue and it creates this nice sky blue color. And I love to leave little streaks of thick white throughout it. Kind of like the sky has like white clouds in it occasionally and that's how I like to think when I'm creating my blue and then of course I like to come in and do some scratches with the back of my brush I like the way that looks say you don't have any brown like right now I actually have no brown uh, out of my paints so I'm gonna create a brown and the brown that I use is opposite colors, which are complementary colors, which are opposite of each other on the color wheel. And actually blue and orange are opposite of each other on the color wheel. So is green and red. So that's nice. And yellow and purple is opposite. So right now I have some blue and I have some orange. So let's see if I can even mix a brown like color onto my paper using wet on wet method. Just curious to see if that even works. I haven't done this in a while, so we'll see how this paint reacts to it. So opposite colors, and now I'm going to get my brush wet. I'm going to add some blue. Oh, that's an ugly brown, but that's okay. If you have brown already, you can use that straight out of the bottle. I kind of like the mixed brown because it gives a more natural look to it. You can see some of that orange underneath. I need to add a little orange down here. Ah, not so bad. I kind of like that brown. I'm actually kind of proud of myself. I'm going to add a little bit of red texture to this. This would be good brown for like if you're doing like a bear or some kind of animal. So a lot of kids like to have browns in their images. And I mean, it, as a choice. might do a little bit of hell. Now, one other um, tip when it comes to working with temper paints, these washable temper paints, is adding white to any of them will actually brighten up that color. Did you see how the yellow didn't look very good? But then when I added some white to it, it started to look kind of cool. Nice. 
My last piece of paper is for the purple. You can see, look what I've done to my table here. I love it. I love this. I love this messy stuff here. Purple. Purple is a combination of red and blue. Again, I can mix it right on my paper if I want to. So I'm going to start with blue again. And if you have purple already in your temper paints, then you don't have to worry about it. Notice how I'm just occasionally just adding water. I'm not adding paint. And if you have some white paper show through, that's just fine. And now I'm going to add some red to this. And I wet my brush some. And there comes the purple. Whatever color you put on top typically ends up being the more dominant color. So sometimes you have to come in with the opposite color again later to even it out. So here's my purplish color. I like it because it looks more natural than just coming straight out of the bottle. It's a little bit blue heavy, so I'm going to add some red. And now I'm going to add some blue parts to make it have a blue effect. And then I'm going to actually water my brush here and I'm going to add some red texture by splatter. The lesson I usually did this with with my students was a first grade lesson. So I think this will work with all the way from pre-K all the way up to third grade. And you can vary it up with technical skills based on the level of student you're working with. There's my purple. So let's take a look at all the colors I have created here. I've got my purple and brown. Let's do it by colors. Got my secondary colors, which are purple, green, and orange. My blue. Oh, do you see that I forgot my yellow? I'm gonna have to come back and make the yellow. I definitely want a, some yellow here. So eight pieces of paper makes makes these colors here. I've got my red here, my white. So eight pieces of paper makes everything except for the yellow. And so I'm gonna need to cut one more piece of paper to create my yellow. Time for some yellow. Like I said, you're might gonna wanna add some white to your yellow to make it brighter. And this is yellow and white are ones you wanna try and keep your paint as clean as possible. Because so they will easily be affected by the other colors. And I like to keep this as bright and light as possible. So I'm going to actually add some yellow, I mean some white highlights to this. To help it stay bright. A lot of kids like to use the yellow for the sun or the happy parts of their picture. The really bright areas. I think this looks pretty good right here. That's my last color. So actually you'd needed nine pieces of paper in order to get the primary and secondary colors plus the um, brown, white, and black because you need those three colors. Okay, for part two, we're going to learn how we're going to take the texture paper we just created and put it together to make a collage very similar to how Eric Carl works. Now for this lesson, the materials I'm going to need is a, an empty cup and I need a cup of water. I need some Elmer's glue and I've got a glue stick here, scissors, and I've got all my textured papers that I created, the nine texture papers. I've got my paint brushes. I have my piece of paper. This is a six by eight piece of paper. For the size of um, texture paper I made that really works, uh, you can change that size and maybe working larger with larger students, I mean with younger students will work a lot better than actually working small 
because the fine motor skills are not quite there yet. A third grader maybe could work at this level, maybe a second grader, but you might want to consider a lot larger for the um, younger students. And then we've got, I, I printed out, I'm going to do a butterfly for mine. So I printed out examples of butterflies. This might be a good option for students. If they choose what insect or what animal they feel like doing, you have to look at any of the Eric Hall uh, books. He uses a lot of different animals, both mammals and insects. This is where you can incorporate your science element into your curriculum. So it could be about something you are studying together as a class or students are um, selectively studying for a different reason. So choose the animal or the insect and print out some copies so that they have something to go by but they do not need to copy it exactly. You have to really teach creativity here that they can go off track. They can create their own butterfly the way they want to, just like Eric Carl does in his video. And then you need to think about some adaptations for those students who really do struggle with being able to draw on their own. You might want to consider a, um, like a template or something like that for students who you know will not be able to cut this or draw this on their own. So it all depends on the grade level you're working with if you need a template or not. Another thing you will need for this is a pencil if you want to be able to draw out your design first. Okay, so here is my composition for B. I'm gonna start by thinking about my grassy area and I'm gonna use this piece of paper and I kind of like how uh, the lines are going vertically if you turn it this way. So I'm thinking I might use that to my advantage. And the other thing is when you think about collaging onto here, you can think about going over the edges. And then what I do afterwards is I come around the back and I cut around the edges to cut it off. So going over should be just fine. All right, so there's some ways to adhere paper to, to um, for collage purposes. There's three ways. These are the two cheapest ways. And then a more expensive way is to use something called matte medium. It is much more expensive. So if you have the budget, do it because it's a lot nicer and it looks really good. But I'm trying to do a low budget version. So we're going to try two different methods here. And I want you to see the difference between these two methods. Okay, first thing I do is I think about like collage. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour some Elmer's glue into the bottom of this cup. And the cool thing is if you have multiple students in the room, you're going to be able to share this glue. And then I have a little bit of water already in there and I'm going to mix it together. One big thing, a big problem with doing this method is it is putting glue on your paintbrush. So try using a paintbrush that you don't really mind. And you want it to be kind of like pancake batter kind of thickness. You don't want it too thin and you don't want it too thick so that you can easily still spread it and then everything will stick just nicely using a paintbrush. If that is too difficult for your students to work with, the other option is using a glue stick. This might be even a better option for uh, your younger ones. Okay. All right. So I'm going to contemplate making some grass here. So I'm going to use these scissors that are um, student grade scissors so that I get used to what using the supplies that they're going to use. I kind of like doing that. So as you know, grass is not going to be completely straight like this. So one thing you might want to consider is ripping it. Look at that. If you rip the paper, it gets a nice cool edge just like that. You see that? And then I can go even further down and I can overlap. I'm going to do some more here. Oh, that fits nicely. Now, if I don't like the way this straight line is coming, what I want to do is maybe tear so it creates a a neat edge right here and then I'll probably want to tear this down so it looks like two parts are kind of coming together and overlapping I think that looks quite nice okay so now I'm ready to 
to glue this part down and while this part is down I can start working on the butterfly that I plan to make up here. All right, so how do we do this? Um, if you are going to be using, I'll show you two different methods. If you're going to be using the paint, I'll show you what it looks like. What you want to do is have a surface where you don't mind getting glue on. So I'm using this. You could use a tray or a, a paper plate or anything like that. And I'm going to take the first one I'm planning to glue. You turn it upside down like this. And you fill the entire area with glue. And your hands will get gluey after this project, but that's okay. I'll teach you a trick to tell your kids on how to get the glue off your hands. And then what I do is I also put glue where I plan to paste this. The cool thing about this is it dries clear. Elmer's glue dries clear as long as you don't have too much of it on there. And then you're going to come back around. Line it up. And smash it down. You have to be careful because if you get too much on there, you might start to get paint that comes up. But I'm really liking the way that this um, presses down and it lays flat. It worked out really nicely. So now let's try the other method, the simpler method, which might work for your students. You got to work kind of fast with these because they really do dry fast. This one is washable and it's clear. You want to make sure it's clear. So I put some on the back all the way around the edges. You really have to tell your students to work all the way around the edges. And it's also a good idea to put some on here too. So let's see what works better. Now that is working just fine too. The, the one thing you're going to notice is where I got the paper wet, it's going to start to wrinkle. But on the glue stick side, you can see that it is nice and flush and flat. So for the most part, you're going to, if you do end up using the Elmer's glue option because you can't afford these for your class, you just need to make sure you allow enough time that later you're going to smash them with some books to get them to be all flat because it will start to wrinkle as you can see. Okay, so from here going forward, I'm going to use the glue stick option, which hopefully you will be able to have for your students. I don't want to leave this though sitting in glue, right? So I'm going to make sure I go ahead and clear this off. I do not want glue to dry on my brush. I did want you to see two different methods for doing this though. Okay, so now how do we make this butterfly-like character here? First of all, I'm going to choose the color I prefer. I'm looking at all of my examples. I want to choose something with multiple colors in it. I don't have to stick to the colors that are in there, but I am going to be inspired by these colors. And one of, one of my favorite colors is red, and the red really is a nice contrast with that green because they're opposite colors. So I think I might go with red. Another option would be this bright orange. It's pretty fantastic. And maybe I could do a little bit of both. Let's try something that I never do anything that is orange. So I'm going to try something orange. So the first thing you want to do is you want to turn it over because you're going to draw your design on the back. So I'm going to have the four wings be the exact same color and then I'm going to overlay some different colored paper on the inside just like you saw in the Eric Carl video. So now you are working with a butterfly. You, you're going to be able to see how you can start to uh, work with multiple subjects in your work. This is arts integration. So you can teach the concept of symmetry if you want to. So that's up to you if that's what the purpose of your project is. Obviously these are all symmetrical. Now the, the image or that you're working with for your class may not be. So if I folded this in half, I'm going to be able to get the exact same wing for both sides. This would be a very difficult subject for anyone under the age of 
like first grade or um, under second grade. So this is more like first, second, and third grade level. It would be very challenging for them to visualize how to do this um, unless you really gave them some examples. So one way you could teach them how to do it is to actually have them cover up one half so that when they're drawing it, they're actually drawing the same shape that they see here. I'm gonna use this little guy here. Now, I kind of like the shape of this one. So mine is going to be, oh, and I need to go from the edge here. So I'm going to do it like this. And I'm going to pretend to draw the other side, which is going to be like this. And then the other one is going to come like this. All right. Now let's see what happens when I cut this. Remember, you want to do it on the fold. You could do it in four different sections if you want to. Or you could keep it together as one. Because overlapping might be really nice for you. You decide. Oh, I like that. Wow. That is so pretty. Okay. So I love it. I'm going to have it be a little bit dynamic, like it's actually flying. And if you want it to, look, if you don't like the way that looks right there, you could even have it kind of flying off here. If you wanted to, I kind of like that. I like to glue down one part at a time so I don't lose track of my pieces. And so what I'm going to do again is I am going to go ahead and apply my glue. At this point, I think that you're pretty much getting the idea. Let's see if I got enough glue on here on how to do this. See if I needed, I didn't need double glue here, but you will. You can see I might need a little bit of double glue here. Double glue meaning you need to actually glue the bottom as well as the object. Looking good. Okay, so I've got my texture paper here. Now I'm ready to add some details if I want to. So I can start cutting out circles. And this is where you could use, if you have a hole puncher or anything like that for students, what if you were able to hole punch a bunch of circles out of here and then have them apply there? I think that's a great idea. I think Eric Carl would do everything on his own because he likes the way it looks when it's misshapen and not perfect. I like the way that looks too. Do you see that? It's not really perfect. And I think it gives it a more fun character to your work. And if you want them to be exactly the same, remember just fold them and then you're making two. I'm going to make kind of a triangle shape. I want you to have fun with this. The only rule is to experiment. Some of you haven't had a chance to experiment with fun shapes like this before. Okay. I like the way that looks so far. Uh, I think these need to be a little bit smaller, so I'm going to trim them down. And then I'm going to glue them down. We'll see how these stick to each other. Looking good. And looking good. This is so much better than using than using um, paper that you buy at the store. This is your own paper. These kids are gonna feel so impressed with their work when they're done. 
So now you can see I really need something to go in the center here for the body. So I'm going to use my brown paper for that. Ah. So I'm going to look at one of these bodies that I like. And I am going to... Whoops. Wrong side. I am going to get an idea of how they are shaped. And then I'm going to cut it out. Now mind you, I probably should have <laughs> drawn that on the other side so it makes it easier to cut out. But that's okay. You'll learn from experience the best way that works. Okay. I like that. I like the way the brown looks. You'll see that students really like having a brown color in their palette to work with. And then what you might want to consider is maybe some antenna. Remember if you're doing two, maybe you want to fold the paper so you can easily have two. I'm going to do these. Well, actually, you know what we could do is we could do this with Sharpie. For those really thin lines, if you wanted to, you could do Sharpie. And so I'm going to draw with just a pencil, just like this. You'll see that Eric Carl does that with some of his. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I am going to uh, work on the text for lesson number three. Okay, for this final part is text and writing or any kind of details you want to do. So I drew this with pencil and I think it's a good idea to take a nice sharp uh, Sharpie and to trace that out so it makes it pop even more like that. So you might do this if you have an insect and you want to do any kind of details around the edges, you can do that too. Now at this point, it depends on the level of your student and the um, handwriting of your student, but this is where you can start to do a language arts lesson as well. Teaching them how to build a one sentence with um, a subject and a verb and to link this sentence to what's happening in your image and also to learn how to sign your name. So there's an option you can do where you could actually sit at the your uh, desk and then you could have the students come up and verbally tell you what they want to say and then you could just type it up for them and print them all at the same time and the kids could just have this little piece that they actually glue down like this. And you can have them glue it down wherever they want on their, paper, on their paper. And then you want to teach them too to sign their name. So that's one option. Now the other option is to let them practice their handwriting. And with something this special, they'll want to do the best that they can. As you can see, that's what it would look like with the text. I don't know if that has the, the, the nice feel of like a handwriting would be. So what I'm going to do is I would encourage you to have them write it with pencil first so that they make any mistakes and hopefully they have eraser they can erase their mistakes and somebody can help them with this so it's a good idea to have them write it on a other piece of paper first before they write it here and to teach them to write it clearly and you might even need to draw a light line for them to help them know where they should draw it because a lot of students who are learning how to write will draw all over the place and so you got to think of different tactics that would work for the level of student that you're working with. And so mine, I'm going to try handwriting it in pencil first. I think that it looks nice when you get to see somebody's handwriting.
and then to sign their name. Okay, and then after that, you would have them trace it in black Sharpie and erase any lines that you have. And the last thing you need to come in after this is totally dry is to use an eraser. If I had an eraser, I'd use it right now. Um, and also you can see, like I told you, if you use any kind of Elmer's glue, it will wrinkle and you're going to need to place this underneath something heavy for like overnight before they're ready. And that is your piece. Thank you.